So welcome everyone to this evening's class on Nagarjuna's Fundamental Wisdom. We're going to begin, as we usually do, with reciting on page 73, the praise to Shakyamuni Buddha, which we'll do three times in English. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan. I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. Go forward then to page 97 or 98, depending on which version of the prayer book. Again, if you have the older, the way older version of the prayer book, I think it's going to be on 87 is the short mandala offering. We'll just do this prayer in English uh, with the offering mantra. And then on page 98 here and page 88 in the really old prayer books uh, is refuge in bodhicitta that will follow this with, and we'll do that once in English, twice in the Tibetan. This ground anointed with perfume strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Niryatayami. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Sangye chodang soki choknam la, jang chu bardu dakni kyabsu chi, daki chanyen gi pe sonam gi, drola penchir sangye drupar Sangye chodang soki choknam la, jang chu bardu dakni kyabsu chi, daki chunen gi pe sonam gi, drola penchir sangye drupar Okay, you can set the prayer books aside and we'll do a short meditation to begin uh, the class tonight. We'll start with a few minutes of meditation on the breath. So whatever technique that you generally use with the breath, you can do that for the next few minutes. Trying to keep your awareness with the breath and being vigilant so that whenever you notice that the mind has wandered away from the breath, you gently guide the mind back to the breath. So I'll ring the chime to start this after a few minutes in silence and I'll lead you in a short reflection to set your motivation for tonight's class.
Now let's set our motivation together. And it's important that we always get back in touch with this fundamental desire that we and all beings have. It is the starting point for everything that the Buddha taught. And to recognize that this is the drive that is underneath all of what we do in our lives, the desire to be happy, the wish to not suffer. But the Buddha says that while that is the starting point for uh, what sentient beings are going through, they are not finding the correct ways of resolving that situation. As Master Shanti Deva says, I'm paraphrasing to some degree, although sentient beings desire to be happy, they run away from its causes. They don't run towards them. And although they desire to be free from suffering, they run towards the causes of suffering, not away from them. This is because we are confused, fundamentally confused about our situation and why we're in it and how we might get out of it. And in this course, we're trying to develop the wisdom that will help us to undermine that root, that ignorance that is keeping us bound, going from life to life. When we think of this human existence, we might not be yet convinced that this is all such a bad thing. The human existence is an opportune one, one where we do generally have the leisure and the opportunity to not have to suffer so much, to not be under the control of so many other factors that would make this life so much more unsatisfactory. But this life is still unsatisfactory. We were born under the control of our ignorance. We continue to live our entire lives under the control of that, and we will die under the control of it if we have not eliminated it. And we've been doing this since beginningless time. We've been in much, much worse states of existence. We've been in blissful states of existence. But we've never found the answer to that fundamental drive to be happy and to not suffer. But this lifetime, we have met with the Dharma. And not just the Dharma that teaches us a path to a good rebirth or a path to liberation, but moreover the Dharma of the Mahayana that teaches the path to complete Buddhahood, to attaining a state where we can achieve our greatest potential, our self-purpose, but moreover we can be dedicated to the welfare of others. We can in that state help all beings to be free from the confusion that they've been under since beginningless time. So now that we've met with the Dharma in this life, this precious Mahayana Dharma, make good use of this time by cultivating the motivation that, that strives to become a Buddha for the sake of all be beings, that motivation of bodhicitta. And think that it's for this reason that you're here to engage in these teachings on emptiness as taught by Nagarjuna in his text. In this way, everything we do tonight is guaranteed to become a cause for that result because this was our deepest wish to use this time for the welfare of all sentient beings. Okay. So we are working our way through the section where after verse uh, 24, Eight, I believe it is. Um, uh, Master Nagarjuna had just kind of gone through and given us these verses, but Lama Tsongkhapa in his commentary decided to elaborate on what was in uh, verse 8 in terms of giving us a more extensive teaching on the two truths. So we have made our way through um, all of conventional truth, and we were in the section on ultimate truth. And as I mentioned last time, I'm cutting out a lot of the sections of the commentary simply because we're going to get really bogged down if we get into some of it. And I have to admit, frankly, I'm not sure how to explain some of the sections in here. This is pretty tough stuff. And I don't have um, a commentary on the commentary from anyone now. There was a commentary from Geshe Tenzin Temple who was in the, um, 
he was over at the master's program as a new geshe there when I was studying there. And uh, he taught on part of uh, what we've studied, verses up through maybe seven of chapter 24. So he hasn't really gone into a lot of the later sections. So, so I am kind of a bit on my own here, um, interpreting Nagarjuna on the basis of my other Madhyamika studies. So we left off last time on page 488 of Ocean of Reasoning, and we're looking at the second section on ultimate truth. First, we had, you know, in terms of the explanation of ultimate truth that began on page 487, we began with looking at the etymology, kind of the meaning of ultimate and truth, recalling here that, again, ultimate means that we are finding kind of this sort of supreme fact, this final fact about things. Um, we do ultimate analysis to try to find if things exist ultimately. We don't find that they exist ultimately, but what we find in the end, our final finding is the not finding, <laughs> is the absence of inherent existence. So it is the fact that is established through a meditative equipoise of an aria. It is uh, a truth in that it exists in the way that it appears. When that aria in meditative equipoise has emptiness appearing to his or her mind, that emptiness appears exactly in accord with how it exists. It lacks even an atom of inherent existence and it appears that way. And so there is no differentiation, unlike our conventional truths that aren't really truths, they're deceptive. They don't exist in the way that they appear. They all appear to be inherently existing. But when we analyze them through that ultimate analysis, we don't find that inherent existence. So in this way, again, there is a difference in what we call conventional truth in terms of its it's not really truth. It's only truth in the perspective of that mind with ignorance that is establishing conventionally and validly uh, phenomena in the world. And we don't say that there's lack of validity to it because what it finds isn't truth in that way. It's valid within its purview, which is simply to you know, understand things that are designated in our world as such and to know them somewhat correctly. Last week, we went into a bit of a longer discussion on real versus unreal conventional truths. And again, for the Prasangika, there are no real conventional truths in the end anyway, because nothing is real in the way that we think it is or that it appears. But uh, nonetheless, there are some things in our world that we can say are easily discerned as deceptive, like a reflection of a face in the mirror, not really being a face. Initially, it appears to us as a face, but we can see that it is just a reflection of the mirror in the mirror or the mirage that appears on the uh, freeway in the summer or something when the sun is beating down and it looks like it's water. It has an appearance of water, but we know that when we drive to that spot, there's no water actually there. So there are some things that um, some of the traditions really get quite hung up on and delineating that these are, you know, things that we can call unreal conventional truths. But in Prasangika's pur purview, everything is unreal. <laughs> you know, the reflections are unreal. Of course, they aren't real in conventional terms as a face. But nonetheless, the reflection of a face is unreal in terms of it doesn't appear, exist in the way it appears. Just like the mirror, just like uh, any object in our world, the person, uh, and so on, even emptiness itself. None of these phenomena exist in the way that they appear when it comes down to the conventional language and so on that we use for them. Emptiness, when it's known directly in that meditative equipoise, absolutely, that's the ultimate truth we're talking about. So we are kind of learning to get our minds to eventually realizing ultimate truth at that level. But we have to recognize that, yeah, we, this is the, the process is to become more familiar with it conceptually, where it still will have an appearance of inherent existence. And eventually that appearance falls away. Emptiness is known directly. We have a direct realization of ultimate truth. And that is truth in that it is non-deceptive. So I don't know that I need to go back and revisit much more of that. We're beginning on the bottom of page 488 tonight with the characteristic of ultimate truth. So again, I'll generally talk for about an hour um, in these classes, and then we'll open it up and see if there are any questions. So the characteristic of, empty, of ultimate truth has two points, uh, two parts, the main point and rebutting objections. Rebutting objections is where I'm going to skim over a lot of it because that gets it's kind of way too deeply into a lot of different stuff that we don't, I don't think it's going to be as useful uh, for our time here. The top of page 489 is the first outline, the main point. So he cites here, Lama Tsongkhapa cites Chandrakirti's text, the Madhyamaka Vatara, which is frequently translated as the supplement to the middle way. 
It's not a commentary on the middle way because Chandrakirti wrote a commentary on fundamental treatise called Clear Words, but it's sort of a supplement to it. And it's a wonderful text. It's a text that is used in the monasteries to uh, explore the meaning of emptiness according to Madhyamika. So he says, according to that text, the characteristic of ultimate truth is said to be that which is found through seeing the facticity, the factualness of a genuine object of knowledge. Uh, genuine, I guess, is getting at that idea that it is one that is the, the most reliable, the most trustworthy object that we can find and seeing the fact of that, the reality of that. Uh, his auto-commentary, Chandrakirti's auto-commentary on his own uh, composition, the Madhyamaka Vatara, says, the ultimate is the nature that is found by being the object of a particular kind of wisdom of those who see reality. But it does not exist through its own nature. This is one of its natures, is that it too is empty. As I said earlier, emptiness itself, though we could say it has Kind of it's a conventionality, we can label it because all phenomena are merely labeled. It is um, uh, not existing by way of its own nature. It too lacks inherent existence. So emptiness as it appears, which you know again to the aria that is in a meditative equipoise on emptiness, how it appears and how it exists are totally in sync. So this is the nature that is found by that person who sees reality. Um, then it says in the next paragraph, since he says, Chandrakirti says, that it is found by the uncontaminated wisdom that perceives things as they really are and does not exist inherently, he refutes those who say that anything that can be found by the uncontaminated wisdom of meditative equipoise is truly existent. This is again getting into that idea that if you say, okay, in the, med in the wisdom of meditative equipoise, I'm trying to find ultimate or true existence. Well, you do find an object, but that object is not inherent existence. It's not true existence. It's the absence of that. You know, recall that again, we're always, you know, finding a negation, a non-affirming negation by virtue of this analysis. So when we finally do, you know, uh, get into that place where we are, are realizing that it's not something that we are finding through the force of our ultimate analysis, our final analysis, like we did find the ultimately, the truly existing person. No, you, you found the absence of that. So that is what is found through this analysis, not the object that you're seeking. Because recall, and when we do ultimate analysis in our meditation, and hopefully again, we'll have some time towards the end of this course to do some meditation together, we go looking for the truly existent person, for example, the truly existent I. And what do you find? You don't find the truly existent I. If you can, well, then let me know and let the Buddha know because the Buddha says it doesn't exist. We find the, the lack of that. So there may be those people who say that if you're talking about what is found by an uncontaminated wisdom, the wisdom of an Arya being, a being that has that superior insight through their analysis, then, then you would think they find something that is truly existing because that's what they're seeking. But they're, they find the absence of that. They find the lack of that. Okay. So in the next paragraph, he says, by saying the particular kind of wisdom in that quote from the, the self-commentary, auto-commentary, he, he means that for the ultimate, it is not enough to be found by just any kind of Arya wisdom, but it must be found by the particular wisdom that knows things just as they are. So again, this we were talking about this being who is sitting in meditative equipoise, who is having this particular wisdom that is appearing, the wisdom that knows how things actually exist by virtue of knowing their lack of inherent existence, knowing their emptiness, knowing that negation. The meaning of to be found in that quote is to be established by that cognitive faculty. Remember how last week I introduced these two definitions of conventional and ultimate truth? You know, and the idea was it's that which is found by a conventional valid, valid cognizer, which becomes eventual valid cognizer in relation to blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's the idea that we do have two distinct ways of establishing valid cognition. One is our conventional valid cognizer, which doesn't look for how things exist at a deeper level. And we once more establish that through the force of our conventional agreement as to what things are and how we relate to things. And we need the conventional. This is gonna come up in one of the verses once we get back into the verses that without the conventional, the ultimate can't even be explained. 
you know, we can't get at the meaning of it without conventionalities. So we have that level of valid cognition that occurs in our everyday world in terms of how we relate to various objects and things. Knowing things correctly within our common agreement as to what the world at large is. But we haven't investigated through a deeper level of valid cognition. That's the ultimate valid cognizer. The valid cognizer that when we go into that deeper investigation, finds emptiness, finds the lack of inherent existence. It's not getting at whether things merely exist, it's getting at how do they exist. Because you know, things exist, and again, that's this wonder of uh, this whole presentation that Tsongkhapa is putting forward. It allows us to know both conventional and ultimate truth so that we don't fall into either extreme. We, we, can, we don't fall into the extreme of nihilism because that things do have a conventional nature. They do exist, albeit very slightly through mere designation, mere imputation. But we don't fall into the extreme of existence and concreteness, holding on to things in that way because we understand ultimate truth, that all phenomena lack inherent existence. So this presentation is really a, an important one to, to understand there are two means of valid cognition. The valid cognizers that know conventional phenomena and this particular wisdom that's being spoken of here that is found, that is cognized in a completely valid, completely uh, uh, non-erroneous way by this wisdom mind that is knowing uh, that object, uh, the object of emptiness. So he continues saying, uh, the meaning is similar in the case of the conventional, just like I explained. You do have objects that are found by each of these valid cognitions. You know, is there a chair in the room? Yes, there's a chair in the room. But then I go, what is, the, what, what is the nature of that chair? Does that chair really exist in the way that it appears? Is it inherently existing? That's the, what is found by the ultimate valid cognizer is the emptiness of that chair, the lack of its inherent existence, okay? The way in which it is found through this particular kind of wisdom is as follows. And it gives the analogy once more of the eyes with cataracts and so on. It says, when the eye that is affected by cataracts sees hairs falling in empty space. That eye, or the eye that is not affected by cataracts does not even see the appearance of falling hair. So you have two different cognitions going on here. The person who has the cataracts, who is seeing the falling hairs. The person who is free of cataracts, who has no such appearance, who can testify, who can know the lack of that. Um, so he goes on to say, in the same way, when those who are impaired by the cataracts of ignorance see such things as the inherent existence of the aggregates, that which is seen by those Buddhas who are free of the latent potentials for ignorance, and by those who have the uncontaminated wisdom that sees things just as they are, just like that which is seen by eyes without cataracts, in virtue of not being seen to be even the slightest bit dualistic. So, okay, so we have the analogy here once more, the person with cataracts sees the falling hairs. The person without cataracts says, uh-uh, there are no falling hairs. This person with cataracts is compared to the person with the cataracts of ignorance, the ignorance that deludes the mind into thinking things inherently exist, that they exist in this fictitious way. That's the appearance to those beings. But the person who's free of those cataracts of ignorance, who has the wisdom that, of a Buddha or the uncontaminated wisdom of an Arya being in meditative equipoise, knows through their direct insight that there are no there's no stains of inherent existence at all. Things do not exist in that way. This is a fictitious view through the force of the cataracts of, cataracts of ignorance. So that's just, again, getting at the fact that while this person, yes, can still be valid with regard to some aspects of existence, with regard to the falling hairs, they are not a valid cognition. With regard to inherent existence, our conventional valid cognizers are not valid because they are knowing something that doesn't, or they are or, uh, apprehending something, uh, grasping at something that doesn't exist in reality. So they are, again, valid within their domain, but nonetheless, within the domain of the ultimate valid cognition, which is the mind of a Buddha or the mind of an Arya in meditative equipoise, that can be seen to be non-factual, non that there's uh, this appearance and the adherence to that appearance of inherent existence through our valid cognition of uh, conventional phenomena is seen to be false. So there is some level to which the valid cognition of an ultimate valid cognizer is superior 
it is giving us, again, that supreme knowledge, that supreme fact by knowing the emptiness of that. So he says, then he, he quotes there, um, I didn't finish that sentence actually, in virtue of uh, being, not being seen to be even the slightest bit dualistic is the ultimate truth. So the ultimate truth appears to the mind without the cataracts of ignorance. So Madhimakavatara, this is back in Chandrakirti's text. Let me read this little verse, verse uh, chapter six, verse 29. Uh, he says, because of cataracts, unreal objects such as falling hairs are mistakenly seen. Their reality is seen by healthy eyes. This should be understood similarly here. So again, there, there is a domain within which ultimate valid cognition will refute what conventional valid cognizers are, are apprehending. They are valid with regard to just establishing phenomena in the world, but they aren't valid with regard to the appearance and adherence to inherent existence because ultimate valid cognition trumps them. It overtakes them and says, you know, you cannot uh, find that to exist at all at once you do ultimate analysis. Within conventional analysis, we're not doing that though, right? We're always just simply kind of knowing things as they are, as they appear and establishing them within that context. So here, uh, Chandrakirti's auto commentary on that verse uh, chapter 6, verse 29 says, the nature of the aggregates that is seen by the transcendent Buddhas who are free from the latent potentials for ignorance is the ultimate truth, just as the person without cataracts does not see the falling hairs. So the way that this person who doesn't see the falling hairs knows the absence of those, it's the same with regard to the ultimate valid cognition that sees the absence of inherent existence that establishes emptiness. He continues, Lama Tsongkhapa now, back saying, this says that the Buddha does not see the objects that are seen by those affected by the cataracts of ignorance through the wisdom by means of which he sees things as they really are, just as the person without cataracts does not see the falling hairs. Okay, so that's the end of that section. And it's essentially just saying, you know, when it comes to the characteristics of this ultimate truth, the characteristics are its emptiness. That is what is known because its emptiness and the realization of that you know, are totally in line. There's no contradiction there. It is true uh, at the deepest level. It's non-deceptive. Now, the objections that are raised on the next few pages, as I mentioned, I'm going to skip over most of this. There's two of, there are two of them. The first one is the objection that says that it is not tenable that the way things really are can be perceived. This is because we often talk about, you know, that this is the, uh, we talk about emptiness in terms of it being um, beyond conception, beyond words, what have you, that there cannot be kind of this domain by which it is known. So there's, there are those people who may object and say, well, but you're talking about something that you can't possibly know. And we, we only can know it through conventional terms, right, at that level. We can talk about emptiness in terms of our, you know, establishing it in the sort of conventional world. To know it at this level is to know it non-conceptually, is to know it almost, again, contrary to what we would normally talk about. But nonetheless, it can be seen. So there is kind of a little uh, argument that's put forward uh, where it says, you say that the Buddha found the ultimate truth through the wisdom by means of which he knows things just as they are. But the Buddha, you know, on, in, well, this is actually a commentary from Chandrakirti, but consider this statement. Is it not the case that such a nature is not seen? Therefore, how could you say that they perceive things or perceive this? Although this is correct as far as it goes, it is said that the manner in which they perceive it is by not perceiving. We often talk about that, that you know, it is a, the, the ultimate seeing is not seeing. Well, it gets to be kind of a little play on words, but we're, we're really talking about once more, you do realize something in the meditative equipoise realizing emptiness. But once more, you're knowing a negation and you're knowing emptiness in a non-conceptual way. It is found by that valid cognition. But it's not, again, um, totally unperceivable. We can talk about it and not know it in its genuine uh, ultimate nature until we have that meditative equipoise. But it still is seen at that level. So the reply comes a few paragraphs later and just says the statement that the manner in which they perceive it is by not perceiving does not mean that no object whatever is seen. You know, the object is seen, but albeit, again, an object that is a negation, an emptiness a lack of inherent existence. So this is what we mean in terms of it. You know, we, we find emptiness by not perceiving <laughs> the inherent existence, by seeing the absence of it. It still is seen, 
I mean, we, we don't, I guess, you know, we, we have em absences, emptinesses in our own life, in our own way, in various ways. Venerable Rabina often talks about how, like, if you have a, a drawer where you always throw your keys, well, and say you went there and you're getting ready to go out to your car and you look in the drawer and you don't see your keys. Well, that's an emptiness you're seeing in a sense, right? You're, it's an absence, an absence of your keys in the drawer where you normally store them. So we do have negations that appear to us, and negations are, are valid phenomena, albeit a little bit unusual for us, right? Because we're, it's a not finding something. It is the absence of something. It is the negation of something. But nonetheless, they are established phenomena. So I'm gonna skip over the rest of this chapter or that section because it goes on for a number of pages. And like I said, it just gets into a, way too much detail. But know that anyone refuting this and saying, well, you know, the, the Buddha might have said, or other beings might have said, you know, that which is the best seeing is not seeing. That doesn't mean you're not seeing anything at that time. You're not realizing anything at that time. You are perceiving something, albeit, again, a negation, an emptiness. Go forward to page 493 if you have uh, Ocean of Reasoning. And the next objection, the second one, says that it is not tenable that empirical phenomena can be perceived. Uh, kind of that when, when one has realized emptiness, then all of empirical phenomena, convention, the conventional world disappears then. Well, it does disappear in meditative equipoise. When you are in meditative equipoise on emptiness, there is no appearance of, an, of any conventional phenomena. But that doesn't mean that you annihilate empirical phenomena by virtue of that wisdom. When you come back out of meditative equipoise, empirical phenomena can still be established. And even in the mind of a Buddha, empirical or conventional phenomena can be established. Now, Buddha has a non-conceptual awareness, so they're not conceiving of phenomena in the same way that ordinary beings do, but they have an omniscient mind, and therefore they know the minds of all beings. So they know everything that is appearing to the minds of all beings, you know, and how they are being labeled and designated and related to and so on. So all empirical phenomena, whether they, and they go into the whole, and if you do have any curiosity about this chapter, this section of this, um, around empirical phenomena, they, they go getting get even into um, uh, that which well they in. Let me see if I can find this section because uh, there are empirical phenomena or conventional phenomena that are pure, uh, that are not affected by the latencies of ignorance, and there are those that are still are. And there's a whole section in the two truths where um, it's the last chapter on omniscience, chapter twelve where Guy Newland goes into a whole discussion about how does a Buddha's omniscient mind know the phenomena of the world? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's an interesting chapter, but I don't know that we need to go into it in so much detail. But know that again, there, there is still a mechanism by which a Buddha can know all phenomena. Of course, he raises a few points in there, like how does a Buddha, if the, the omniscient mind of a Buddha is a phenomenon, how does a Buddha know their own mind? <laughs> Anyway, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe things that you can kind of, you know, do bring us to a cocktail party and get into some interesting discussions about <laughs> that whole thing. And you know, have you ever thought about how a Buddha knows all phenomena? And anyway, so know that there is no way that 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 the wisdom realizing emptiness in any way annihilates conventional phenomena. It just gets rid of this fictitious way that we think that conventional phenomena, you know, exist. Uh, in that way that they exist. I'm having a little bit difficulty with my words tonight, sorry. All right, so any, maybe I will check in and see if there's any questions on this point, because we're getting into um, one more chapter, one more section, classifications of ultimate truth. Everyone's okay? Yeah, Stephen. Yeah, just on page 489. Okay. Page 489 of... Um, Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Okay. So Stephen's uh, questioning about the use of the word dualistic in this phrase. It was in that long sentence that I read, and I, I again I, when I read it the first time, I, I didn't I stopped before getting to the final bit. But it says just like that which is seen by eyes without cataracts, in virtue of not being seen to be even the slightest bit dualistic, is the ultimate truth. Dualistic has kind of a number of different meanings in, um, in how it's used. How we're using it here is the idea that there is no longer any 
uh, false view of inherent existence at that time. That's one way that we can talk about dualistic appearance. This is why for the Bodhisattva, the objective is to get rid of the knowledge obscurations that keep that dualistic appearance, that keep an appearance of inherent existence. These are those, that appearance and the um, uh, clinging to that appear, or I'm sorry, and the latencies of the ignorance that cause that appearance. Those are the knowledge obscurations. Whereas ignorance and all the delusions and their seeds are the afflictive obscurations. So when, when a being is in meditative equipoise or a Buddha's mind, because that was the two that were pointed out in that sentence, right? It's seen by those Buddhas who are free of the latent potentials for ignorance and by those who have the uncontaminated wisdom that sees things just as they are. For those minds, there's no longer any appearance of inherent existence. Now, it also will infer the, the second meaning, which is that there's no longer any dualistic subject object and that's maybe another way that you can talk about it. But the main one that's being emphasized here, as I understand it, is the dualistic appearance of a appearance of inherent existence, because that's what it's showing is that emptiness at that time, its nature is to be empty of inherent existence. And that is in accord with how it appears. You have no false appearance going on there at all, unlike with conventional phenomena. Okay. It would imply in this case, because in the case of someone being in meditative equipoise on emptiness, they don't have that differentiation of subject and object, because that's conventional. That's a, a conventional designation we give to the subject of awareness and the objective reality that's being realized. They, will, they can say when they came out of me, their meditative equipoise, when they're back in conventional reality, oh, my mind realized emptiness directly, and they talk about it in a dualistic way. But in the moment, there's no dualistic appearance at all. And I think there's a third way we talk about dualistic, and I think it means simply just conventional, you know, that you know, there's no conventionalities appearing. So it's lacking, having the lacking of, an, of inherent existence, which is the main one here, having a lacking of, a, uh, well, this would be non-dualistic. So when we talk about it being non-dualistic, free of that dualism, you'd have it being no appearance of inherent existence, no differentiation of subject and object, and no conventionality appearing. Yeah, Bob. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I think yeah. When you talk yeah. about the. Yeah. So we can't be mm. mm. Right. Right. So so again yeah when we talk about appearance of things. In the meditative equipoise, we have to say again that emptiness is known, is validly cognized by that mind. But it's none of the none of the way we think of appearance and that we talk about appearance in terms of that dualism and that inherent existence that's there, or that's appearing there. Yeah. Yeah, and I think what's really going on is that you have the meditative equipoise. You're in a sort of deep experience. Yeah. You know, we don't have any words to describe <laughs> Sure. And we seem to sure. Be, you know, go through that experience. Yeah. We seem to have some kind of memory of it. Mm -hmm. there. Sure. Outside of that, we don't realize the inheritance. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's a funny right. thing, you know, to talk about. Yeah. But I don't think, you know, we don't have a language to talk about. Sure. It's beyond language, yeah, beyond words. So Bob was just pointing out, yeah, that I mean, we're really talking about, you can relate to that experience afterwards. It's like you go into the experience and you come out of the experience. While you're in it though, again, the conceptual mind isn't active. You're having that direct awareness. And so it's beyond words, beyond concepts at that point. And we can relate to it afterwards because obviously they say that even after the first initial direct realization of emptiness, your view of all phenomena is totally different because they'll have that appearance of inherent existence, but you have no belief in that whatsoever. You know that it, they don't exist in the way that they appear because your knowledge has been gained through that experience. So it's not just, you know, some, uh, I don't know what words to use, sort of a uh, experience in, a, in quotes, but it's, it's a knowledge. You're gaining knowledge, you're gaining wisdom. You're gaining a valid cognition of emptiness in its genuine way, as was explained earlier on that page. 
the facticity, I love that word, I had to look it up, I'm sorry, I knew that fact was in there, so I just, <laughs> the facticity of a genuine object of knowledge. Anyway, Stephen, were you going to say more? Or? Yeah, so, so in, in non-duality. Uh-huh. Probably better to say non-duality. Non <laughs> Right. Sure. I mean, no, because there are no conventionalities appearing, any relative concepts like here and there, or you and I, or self and other, all these are gone. And again, there, it's not that there is no subject and object in that experience. There's no differentiation of subject and object. We don't have, so, so you can still, again, like I said, you can point back to it and say there was a subjective awareness that did realize the object of emptiness. We have to say that that happened or it doesn't become a valid cognition. But in, this, in the midst of that experience, no sense of subject and object. It, they say it's like fresh water poured into fresh water. So you don't have this differentiation going on because differentiations are conventional. <laughs> the taste of emptiness, again, as we talked about earlier, is that, that experience of no you know, no inherent existence and so that lack of inherent existence in the mind realizing it there's no appearance of them being differentiated as subject and object so we're talking about an appearance not being there but nonetheless we would we, like i said you would you, you would be hard pressed to say there was no subjective awareness that realized the object emptiness because that's our conventional way of talking about it and we still can say that that occurred but in the midst of that, you don't have any of that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it sort of makes sense because, you know, if all you're seeing is the lack of inherent existence, right? And then subject lacks inherent existence, and object lacks inherent existence, so they really are the same. Yeah. At that level, you're knowing that nature. Yeah. Right. It's only at the level of conventionality that things have distinguishing features because the taste, as we talk about, is one. Not that those, again, we can still say the emptiness of person and the emptiness of, of mind and the emptiness of whatever are unique phenomena because they're related to a conventional phenomena, but they're one in terms of their taste. So, so yeah, it's interesting to talk about. I, I always go back to that one, I, I probably should have brought it in with me when we're talking about this subject. Uh, the path to the middle that I think I mentioned previously, Anne Klein's um, conversations with Yeshe Topton, something or other, I can't remember, maybe, yeah. Anyway, I can't remember is the full name. This Lama said that when you're in meditative equipoise on emptiness, an atom bomb could go off and you wouldn't, it wouldn't register, you know, because you are single pointedly absorbed in emptiness in this non conceptual way that none of these other things appear. No, nothing else can be going on in the mind. <laughs> so it's, you know, this is what this Lama said. I don't know if it was from actual experience or not, but if he was in meditative equipoise and an atom bomb went off. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> In this context, well, so, so Mark's, yeah, Mark's question. So, so I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm heard, I heard what you said. I'm not sure I got all the parts of it, but, but the idea in meditative equipoise, when we talk about meditative equipoise, that term is used to refer to a direct realization of emptiness. And it's one that one enters into through the force of the analytical meditation that leads one to understand emptiness at that. And when one has the 
commensurate depth of concentration, then one enters into this absorption where one is absorbed on emptiness single pointedly. And so from that space, what, what I was referring to was from that space of the mind absorbed in emptiness, where these two again are like water poured into water, where there's no differentiation, where this realization is occurring. There's nothing else that can appear to that mind. You know, it doesn't sense, oh, I'm sitting on my cushion realizing emptiness. It doesn't sense the air around the person in the room where they're meditating. It doesn't sense any of this. But it could, but it, but it could I think meditative equipoise can be actually really quite quick. It, it doesn't have to be very long, but it is a transformative experience if one has it. I don't think that you can, I mean, if someone says, well, I think I had a meditative equipoise and emptiness, I, I would doubt it because I don't think you think you have one. I think you know you have one just from what I've heard. So I don't, I don't believe it's the sort of thing that one can stumble on in the way it's taught in this tradition. I'm not denying that there are other traditions that talk about these spontaneous moments, a sartori or whatever in the Zen tradition where one has this occur. I don't know what to say about those, but in this tradition, it is a product of one's familiarity with emptiness. Specifically, again, when we go to the five paths, it's the path of preparation, the second level, where one becomes more and more familiar over four levels of practice with emptiness and a, a weakening of that differentiation of subject and object, a weakening of the uh, conviction in that appearance so that the mind becomes very, very close to this and eventually at the final moment crosses over into the path of seeing, your first meditative equipoise on emptiness. And at the path of seeing, that can be, again, oh, I agree with you, it can be over very quickly, I think, because it's only at a moment of realizing emptiness and then immediately the, the liberated path occurs. You are free then of, at that level, the innate, I'm sorry, the acquired uh, uh, afflictive obstructions. You can't find the inherently existent self. Okay. Uh -huh. At some point, it becomes obvious that the inherently existent self doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, there's a flash of non-existence. Mm -hmm. And then, but that non-existence, of course, creates stress because it breaks all the rules of existence. I mean, you've got these two, the two truths are like, they can't, they can't it's difficult for them to Although, as you say, they are simultaneously yeah. consistent. And so right. then, then at that point, the world shifts back to your, your uh, yeah. spatial. If, if in what you were describing, Mark, again, for those on, online, I'll just briefly sum it. When one goes into, through realizing the lack of an inherently existent I or self, finds that emptiness, that non-existence, if it becomes non-conceptual at that point, and we do generate a meditative equipoise, if it's at the end of the path of preparation, for example, and we are bridging over into this direct realization of emptiness, then yes, you get into that space where you don't have any of those sorts of thoughts, though, of, of trying to uphold conventionalities within you know, the sphere of ultimate truth. You don't have anything appearing to the mind but that wisdom realized, that object of emptiness. But I'm getting at the idea that, that that falls apart to a degree conceptually, but one has to go into a non-conceptual experience of that. And then, like you said, when one comes out of the non-conceptual experience of that, at that point, though, I think you would actually see the absolute kind of complementarity of conventional truth and ultimate truth, because you've understood how conventional things actually exist because you've seen their lack of inherent existence. You know that there can be nothing more than phenomena merely designated, merely imputed, because you have denied that they have anything more than that. So I think, again, we do have, and I'm not denying that in, in our conceptual meditations on emptiness, we have some flavor of that appearing. Hopefully we all have some taste of it that we've developed through our meditation on emptiness already that we can kind of go, okay, I'm kind of getting what it's like, what it's about. But that's still a concept. It has to, again, bridge that gap between conceptual awareness into non-conceptual awareness, which is what 
ultimate truth is defined at is, is, is the object found by that meditative equipoise on emptiness, that uncon uncontaminated wisdom, knowing that reality. Yeah, Bob. Hmm. Sure. I think that what they seem to say in our tradition is that to really penetrate to mm. the breadth of the same teaching takes extraordinary concentration. Yeah. Because it's concentration which has the penetrating power. The stability. And, yeah. and I, I think that the whole range of different realizations oh. that you can have and deeper and deeper, but it depends on mm -hmm. what level of concentration you're able to reach. Right. Right. Exactly. Sure, sure. So Bob was just reiterating uh, some of this is that, yeah, we have, in any of our realizations, we have gradations of it, movement towards it. And so the depth of concentration that we have will be a big factor in terms of our ability to bridge that gap to get into a, a non-conceptual awareness. But it also, again, has to do with the familiarity with emptiness that we've generated through that process. Like I said, on the path of preparation, there are those four levels. And each level, you go to the next one by virtue of your awareness of emptiness and what you're doing with around that whole concept of the way it's talked about classically is the apprehender and the apprehended, the subject and the object. And that, again, begins to become thinner and thinner as one keeps through that, those through, moves through those four stages. When one moves from the path of preparation into the path of seeing, that veil falls away entirely. There's nothing dividing in that sense, subject and object. There's no longer that differentiation in terms of an appearance. So let's continue on so we can do a little bit more and hopefully get back to the verses because they're coming up very soon, just within a few pages. And I'm gonna skip a fair amount of this section as well. This is the third section on ultimate truth. So again, we saw that etymology, where does it come from in terms of Dondam Dempa, the, the Tibetan for that, as well as a Paramatta, I think Paramatta is the Sanskrit. But anyway, then we went on to the characteristics of ultimate truth. truth. Now we're getting to the classifications of ultimate truth. How many kind of divisions and how can, because this is where in the previous one on conventional truth, we talked about real and unreal. Well, and we look at what's in that section, he once again goes to the Madhyamaka Vatar, Chandrakirti's text, which says that the ultimate truth, this is page 495, can be elaborately divided into 16 kinds of emptiness. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's also 20 kinds of emptiness. So there are, there are different presentations. Um, it says here, there's also an intermediate division into four, emptiness of entity, emptiness of non-entity, emptiness of self, and emptiness of other. So we can make as many divisions of emptiness as you want. You can say the, the emptiness of animals, and then you've got all the different animals, their individual emptinesses, the emptiness of human beings, the emptiness of, I mean, you can make whatever, sort of summations of things, but there, the emptiness is the same in terms of it being a lack of inherent existence. It's just what the object is that is referring to. But know that again, emptiness doesn't exist on its own as some sort of independent phenomenon out there. Like I said earlier in that discussion we had with the one night, when we say like, for example, in Tantra that you arise out of emptiness, it doesn't mean that there's this phenomenon called emptiness that has its own sort of nature out there that we're a singular phenomenon. Emptiness is re in relation to every individual phenomenon that exists. So there's emptiness of chair, that chair, that chair, that chair. Those are all different emptinesses because they are emptiness of a different object. But they're the same in taste and that they are all a negation of inherent existence. So I'm not going to go into all these divisions. Lama Sunkapa skips over them. He says the brief division is into two the emptiness of the person and the emptiness of phenomena. Well, the, the person is a phenomenon. What we mean usually when we make that delineation is person is a subset of the emptiness that is important. Why? Because it's usually where we begin our realization of emptiness by analyzing the I, the person. It includes other pre people too, though. It's the emptiness of Stephen, the emptiness of Nancy, the emptiness of whoever. We, we can say that, again, that emptiness of persons is applicable to every being that exists, every person or being um, that is established. But it's set out as a separate subset because of the need for us to focus on that first. 
emptiness of phenomena includes everything else other than persons. So it includes chairs and tables and uh, apples and uh, the sky and you know whatever. Every phenomenon that we establish uh, is included in that category other than persons. According to other treatises, he continues, the ultimate is twofold, the primary ultimate truth and the secondary ultimate truth. Well, we don't use this terminology so much, but we can say the primary one is the one that is the actual ultimate truth. It is the phenomenon that is found by that meditative equipoise realizing emptiness that appears the way it exists, that is non-deceptive. The secondary one is the one that how we are knowing emptiness, all of us in the room as we're talking about it tonight, thinking about emptiness. It's through the means of a meaning generality. It's through the means of our conceptual awareness. Recall that our, our conceptual awareness is always bound by that. If I ask you to think about anything, you have to bring something into your sphere of awareness to think about it. Even if you're looking at it right now, like if I say, look at the yellow on the walls here, you know, and, and think about that yellow, is that yellow lighter or darker than canary yellow? You know, and you would have to go through your own little analysis in your mind. Well, then for you to bring that yellow that you're seeing through your eye consciousness into your mind to think about it, you have to use a meaning generality. It has to use some sort of image of it that you are then stacking next to canary yellow and trying to decide which one is a brighter or darker yellow. If you can do that, I don't know. Or if we could say the yellow on Mark's shirt tonight. Mark wore yellow, so I could do this. <laughs> so, okay. So again, the conceptual mind knowing emptiness is what I'm believing they're referring to here as the secondary ultimate truth. If I'm wrong on that, I apologize, but that's my understanding. I didn't find any commentaries on that, but we don't usually use that language so much, primary and secondary ultimate truth. We mean the, the ultimate truth as it is known by that wisdom and the ultimate truth that we can speak about. That is still a concept. For instance, the Sadhya Vaya Vibhaga says, since the re refutation of such things as arising is consistent with reality, we assert that it is ultimate. So this is why I interpret it that way is because it seems to be referring to a conceptual refutation of things arising uh, in an inherent way. And that's consistent with this reality that we are talking about, the primary ultimate truth. Therefore, we're going to call it the ultimate. That's why we say we're studying emptiness, we're meditating on emptiness. You're not actually realizing emptiness in its true nature, which is lacking inherent existence as it appears to that wisdom of emptiness, wisdom knowing emptiness directly. But nonetheless, we'll say you're meditating on emptiness, that you're meditating on ultimate truth. And the Madhya Makaloka uh, says, uh, since non-arising is consistent with the ultimate, it is called ultimate, but it is not actual. The actual is that ultimate, which is free from all fabrication. Here, fabrication, oh, no, I'm not gonna, I had marked that to skip because it gets into all this again. We already have talked about this. Fabrication once more being anything, an overlay of any inherent existence. Okay, that's all I wanna say. I think I'm gonna skip over the rest of this section that the classifications of ultimate truth are as many as you can, you know, you know, as you wish but nonetheless, they're generally talked about in categories of 16 or four or 20 um, or two is the most common one in terms of persons and phenomena. Let's go forward to page 497. This is the final outline. We had an outline on conventional truth. We had an outline on ultimate truth. The third outline is the presentation of the enumeration of the two truths. And I'm just gonna go through this, just parts of it because we already talked about this. It's essentially the idea that these are a dichotomy Dichotomy means that if something is included within it, it has to be one or the other. So if something exists, if it is an existent, an object of knowledge, it has to be either a conventional truth or an ultimate truth. It cannot be both and it cannot be something that is neither of those, if it exists. So let's even go down to um, this quote from Prasanapada. Prasanapada is the uh, clear words commentary from Ch Chandrakirti on this text by Nagarjuna. He says, all conventional things, such things as expressions and that to which expressions refer and all knowledge and objects of knowledge should be known as mundane conventional truth. Since it says that all conventional objects are conventional truths, all objects of knowledge are comprised by the two truths. When anything is precluded from being a deceptive or unreal object, its being a non-deceptive object must be affirmed. So if it is an object of knowledge that is, that is knowable, 
it's either going to be deceptive or non-deceptive. It's either going to be conventional truth or it's going to be ultimate truth. If it is, if it is not non, if it is not deceptive, then it has to be non-deceptive. It has to be ultimate truth. You know, so if, if it isn't included in conventional phenomena, conventional truths, then it has to be included within ultimate truths. If it isn't included within ultimate truths, it has to be included within conventional truths. Therefore, being deceptive or non-deceptive, or again, we could say being conventional truth or ultimate truth, are mutually exclusive and exhaustive. You will not find anything not included, and it's going to be one or the other. Never both, and again, never neither. The fact that being deceptive and non-deceptive are mutually exclusive and exhaustive applies to all objects of knowledge, thus categorizing them. Therefore, there is no third alternative. Thus, one should understand that the two truths precisely enumerate all objects of knowledge. And I don't need to, again, go through the rest of this, I think. It's a very simple point at some level, but it's just reiterating that there isn't something else that is like a third truth or some third category of what exists. If it exists, it's conventional truth and is deceptive, or it is non-deceptive and ultimate truth. Now we finally get back to the text. Yay. <laughs> so this, this next outline, we're getting back into kind of these outlines that, um, just so you know, that we're, this is all still within the very first point under showing their, that their argument rests on not understanding the two truths. This is, again, we had that whole beginning part to this chapter, the first seven verses, where we had somebody coming forward and saying, well, if you, if you hold emptiness to exist, well, then the Four Noble Truths don't exist, and the Four Noble Truths don't exist, and the Three Jewels don't exist, and da-da-da-da, kind of going on. And, and so we had that verse eight, where Nagarjuna you know, says, I think maybe this was actually the first six verses where we did that. And then there was, yeah, verse seven is where he began the refutation. Uh, verse eight was where he has said, essentially, it's all dependent upon understanding the two truths. Well, now we're still in that kind of refutation of the argument that was being put forward. And this, again, outline is called, why if you do not understand the two truths, you do not understand the essence of the scriptures. So let's read verse nine as it is on our sheets, which you again have, uh, all of you have, I think. Those who do not understand the distinction between the two truths do not understand the Buddha's profound teaching. So he's essentially saying that any of these other Buddhists, you know, or anyone who's proclaiming to, you know, uh, have some awareness of uh, the profoundness that the Buddha taught in terms of selflessness and so on, if they don't understand the two truths, they haven't really gotten it yet. We have to kind of, again, get that reality of how things actually exist and their lack of inherent existence. So with that verse in mind, Sankhapa says, the Buddha's way of teaching the Dharma relies on the two truths. Those who do not understand the distinction between the conventional truth and the ultimate truth, as it has been explained above, you know, what we've just gone through over these last few sessions, do not understand the Buddha's teaching of the profound dependent origination, the way things really are. Therefore, if one desires to understand the essence of the teaching, one must understand that to the extent that dependently arisen and dependently designated conventional phenomena appear like the moon in the water, action and agent are tenable. Just on this ground, one should understand the ultimate, which is the elimination of the two extremes of inherent existence and of complete nihilism. So this is this whole idea, again, that when we come to understand the two truths, if we don't understand dependent origination, we can't understand the two truths. Recall that dependent origination refers to how things exist conventionally. Every phenomenon that is produced dependent upon its causes and conditions, every phenomenon whatsoever dependent upon its parts, and in the end, every phenomenon dependent upon mere designation, mere, you know, through the force of a conceptual awareness, giving it its identity. It doesn't have its own identity. It's not established from its own side. That is the emptiness side of it, that it lacks that by virtue of needing, requiring other factors for its, for its to arise, being dependent upon them, says that it cannot be independently existing. It cannot self-establish. Self it cannot have any manner of existence that is substantial, existing from its own side, existing by way of its own characteristics. So once more, we're going to see this coming up when we get into some of the verses in, that are in chapter 24 ahead of us. 
that the idea that dependent origination and emptiness are totally comp complementary and compatible. And they are speaking to the same thing just from the perspective of how things arise and they're dependently existing to their lack of any independent existence, their in lack of inherent existence. As we said, these are inextricably bound up in everything that exists. We can focus on that aspect and know it's emptiness. When we you know, get to the point of almost falling into nihilism, we can reassert its existence through its dependent origination that it arises on the basis of very factors. And then sometimes we start clinging to that too much and we see it as inherently existent, then we have to go back to emptiness. This is what we'll keep doing in our analysis until we get to a place where we realize that directly and then we'll know that things have to exist in this way of dependent origination because there's no other way for them to exist. We've refuted anything more than that by virtue of that realization. And then eventually you get to the state of Buddhahood where you know these two all the time with regard to all phenomena. Because you know their emptiness, you're in single, single point of meditative equipoise on all of that. You know, that's a part of a Buddha's mind, but you have also appearing to it, everything else that is conventionally designated, everything else that we, you know, determine to exist by virtue of those other factors. So this is just that in verse nine that essentially is, you know, Nagarjuna is saying, well, you know, you haven't, uh, if you haven't understood the distinction between these two truths, which means you haven't understood dependent origination and emptiness, then you do not understand the Buddha's profound teaching. You really haven't gotten it yet. Let's go on then to the next outline, which is a, another one still within this section where the Nagarjuna is showing that the argument that the people have put forward rests on not understanding the two truths. The, there's a little prelude to reading the verse. Let me do that first. This outline is called the necessity of presenting the true truths. The previous one was again about how, you know, we may not uh, get it if we don't understand the two truths. Therefore, it's necessary, it's needed for us to be able to have a presentation of the two truths that we find viable, that we find, you know, at the deepest level makes sense. Suppose someone argued as follows. This is again, an imaginary arg argument or opponent. Since the nature of the ultimate is to be free from elaboration, one could just teach that. Why teach the conventional, such as the aggregates, elements, faculties, truths, and dependent origination? Those which are not the ultimate are to be abandoned, and there is no point in teaching something that is to be abandoned. Well, to some degree, you know, this person is basing it on the reality that you do <laughs> abandon all of the fictitious views of conventional phenomena that we've been with. But you never, in the end, abandon conventional phenomena. This is how everything has always existed. It's the other side of the coin. If you say, well, I only want to teach, you only have to teach this side of the coin because it doesn't really matter the other side because all of that is to be abandoned. Well, as I said earlier, you need conventionalities in order to know ultimate truth. That's the only way ultimate truth is established is through conventionalities by virtue of it being together with its own unique phenomenon that is uh, an object of knowledge, as well as we need conventional ways of designating things, working with things in order to even talk about emptiness. So let's read verse 10 as it was in uh, the uh, sheets that I gave you that come from His Holiness's book. Without a basis in the conventional truth, the truth of the ultimate cannot be taught without understanding the ultimate truth, nirvana will not be attained. So if you say that, you know, you can get to nirvana without understanding conventional truth, well, no, you have to have conventional truth to establish ultimate truth. You need ultimate truth in order to get to nirvana. So uh, let's read, or let's go through what um, Tsongkhapa says on page 498. I'm commenting on this. He says, it is true that the erroneous conventions the appearance of things that do not exist in reality as though they do are to be abandoned. But without relying on the mundane ultimate, again, what we called earlier that secondary ultimate, you know, without relying on that, including such things as expressions and that to which they refer and knowledge of, and objects of knowledge, which are, according to the Arias, nominal conventional truth, the ultimate truth cannot be taught. You know, without the conventionalities, we're lost. Yeah. Remember I pointed out, and was that last week when Gil brought the book for you, The Dependent Arising and Emptiness by Elizabeth Knapper. It's in there where I f first ran across that thing that Manjushri, when he appeared to Tsongkhapa, gave him that advice to value conventionalities. Well, why? Because we have to value conventionalities. We need conventionalities. 
We just need to know them correctly. <laughs> right now we're knowing them incorrectly, as was said in that beginning part of what I just read. It's true, we have to abandon the erroneous ways that we are looking at those conventions. But we still have to rely upon conventions. Even the Buddha has to rely upon conventions to teach the Dharma to other beings, right? You know, if we had no, if the Buddha had no embracing of conventional truth in terms of the sphere of knowledge of the Buddha, the Buddhas wouldn't be able to communicate to us, wouldn't be able to put the Dharma into words that we could read and examine and analyze and so on. You know, yeah, Bob. Right. No. Well, I don't know. I'm Bob saying uh, that he's Sonkapa is not really providing the explanation of why we need conventionalities, but I think he is. He's saying again, you know, that in that very sentence, but without relying on the mundane ultimate, including all the expressions and so on, you know, nominal conventional truth, the ultimate truth cannot be taught. Yeah, you know? but, but he's, he's asserting that. Yeah. He's not but what would you say is what would you say is an additional reason that would be required to explain well, why that's true? He would, have, he, would, he would have to explain, for example, uh, why couldn't you just in meditative equipoise correctly realize that it's about the line of Yeah. In, in other words, there is no argument in that statement. Yeah. I, mean, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying, but 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 it which I, I'm fine with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Careful, right, so right. Read more into the text. Yeah. So, I guess it's implicit in my mind because it's sort of saying, you know, that that without having a way of talking about it, you can't realize it. It's sort of the same thing. Like, if if you could say that somebody could realize quantum physics without some investigation into what leads to it, you know, that you would suddenly be sitting under a tree and have quantum physics appear to you. I guess it's implicit in my mind that you can't have that without relying upon. I, I think you're relying on other things. Yeah. That's possible. That's possible. Yeah, that, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. That if I try to honestly read the text yeah, yeah. in that text, you know, you're making additional arguments that Kankapa isn't making. Yeah. And which, which are probably valid. Mm -hmm. but, but anyway, I, mean, yeah. I, mean, I, was, I was sort of curious. <laughs> he actually did yeah. 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 It's probably because he, he, he does that, those arguments elsewhere. Yeah. I would say, on the basis of everything else we've discussed, we've gotten to where he was using brevity here, perhaps, you know, with that implicit uh, understanding as to why it was necessary, but, yeah. yeah. Right, exactly, yeah, yeah. So then he goes on, he says, without understanding the meaning of the ultimate, nirvana cannot be achieved, which is essentially what, you know, Nagarjuna says in the last two lines of his text, of his uh, verse, Therefore, since it is a means for achieving liberation, just as a person who desires water looks for a vessel, one who aspires for liberation must undoubtedly, at the beginning, accept the conventional just as it is. So it's an interesting analogy of like, you know, if you want water, you need something in which to scoop the water up to be able to bring it to your mouth, right? Well, if you want the wisdom of emptiness, you need the conventional approach to it accepting conventional things as a means by which you can understand it so you can then eventually taste the wisdom of emptiness. You need it as a bridge again to be able to get you from that conceptual, uh, uh, investigative and analytical understanding of emptiness to a direct realization. Is it making some sense? Well, I, I just think that there's, I mean, you could say you need the conventional truth to, to perform an, uh, an analysis and investigation, but at the same time, like you said, mm. the conventional truth is just the, the flip side of the ultimate truth. And in right. that sense, the ultimate truth is very personal of the conventional truth. So, yeah, of course, you've got to have it. True. So, so, absolutely, as you're pointing out, Mark, I mean, because these two are, you know, kind of intertwined, you don't have any ability to. You know, we can conceptually isolate the conventional nature of things versus the ultimate nature when we finally realize that. Right now, what we know of as conventional, <clears throat> and even the way that we might bring emptiness to mind through our, you know, 
meditation on emptiness and so on is still going to be together with that false appearance. It's still going to be together with, you know, that taint of uh, the, um, yeah, appearance and adherence to inherent existence of that emptiness. But, but there will still be a trace of that, that ultimate existence wherever we look and conventionally. Well, until we achieve Buddhahood, sure. I mean, there always will be in terms of when we're off, up off the cushion after realizing emptiness directly for the first time, everything will have that appearance. But I mean, even before that, Sure. There's a there's a certain yeah. There's a certain there's the smell of emptiness. <laughs> I mean, there's all kinds of knots and confusions and mysteries yeah. and, and yeah. oddities and yeah. Yeah. you know the, 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 the yeah. I guess so. I guess, but then again, we'd still would be dependent upon conventionalities, even with the list that you've set out in terms of other things that might help us in the move in the direction of emptiness. We do need conventional awareness of things and to begin to question that in order to even get to that point. Again, Tsongkhapa may not, may not be saying that in as direct a way like Bob was pointing out, but how could we have a realization of something we've never even thought about? a direct realization of something we've never even thought about. We have to first think about it and then it becomes, and even, even I would say in some of the other traditions that don't talk so heavily about techniques of realizing emptiness, I don't think that they think that at some point you have this instant non-conceptual awareness of something that you've never thought about. Because even in using koans and things like that, the idea is to get you to a place where the conceptual mind falls away, but you still were using your conceptual mind to get there. <laughs> conventionalities still have to be utilized as a tool because we live in the mundane world. We live with conventional, conventional truth surrounding us in a sense. We live with emptiness surrounding us, but we're not aware of emptiness surrounding us. Conventional mm. reality hurts. Conventional reality hurts. <laughs> 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 that, 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 that suffering is actually yeah. the, the, the appearance of yeah. Anyway, that's an interesting point. So let's 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 pause here and let's let's open it up because I don't know if the folks on online have been able to catch a lot of this. I'm sorry, I haven't been able to convey everything in terms of um, tonight. But there are a lot of different discussions going on. Anything from the folks at home or online? even though the observers had attached centers to his head. This seems to me that it must be beyond the mental and into changes in physical experience. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, Venerable Mathieu Ricard is a monk in the Nyingma tradition who's been tested a lot in terms of his meditative abilities, and they put all the little sensors around his you know, skull to be able to um, you know, pick up what's going on in various parts of his brain on the basis of his meditation. And, and so Rowena was saying that they, he wasn't have any reaction to things that were going in terms of you know, any of this while he was in meditation. So it's showing, yeah, showing that there's a very deep level of awareness that's abiding there in that space that is not, again, these other things are not appearing. I don't know what he was realizing at that time. I don't have <laughs> that knowledge. Sometimes when they did this, they were asking him to meditate on compassion because they were trying to register a lot of things that were going on in those parts of the brain. But, but anyway, I, if he's med in meditative equipoise on emptiness, if someone was able to hook up all of this to somebody in meditative equipoise on emptiness, I'm sure you'd find some interesting things. <laughs> Any other comments or questions in terms of what we talked about tonight? Yeah. Oh, they fired a pistol by his head. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Did it do any damage to his ear? <laughs> Even though he may not have heard it, you might do something. I don't know. That's interesting. <laughs> then what, what kicks you out of? Meditative equipoise. I don't know. I mean, you know... I, you, you, you must be you know, stirred out of it from some kind of completion, some sense that it's fulfilled. I don't know. Yeah, Bob? I mean, what I've read is that people who do 
Uh, any of these really deep level concentrations sort of set a mental time limit. Right. About yeah. Where to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, so, and, 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 yeah. And, and that time's up. Yeah, Bob was saying that, that, you know, he's heard that they, you know, when people go into meditation concentrations, that they set sort of a mental alarm clock, you know, that kind of gives them a feeling of when the, when the time is up and they come out. I guess with meditative equipoise on emptiness, I, I just don't know if it's quite the same because you're in a non-conceptual awareness at the time. So you don't have any of your memories active or any of the other sort of thoughts. So I think there must be some, again, some sense of completion, like, you know, you're you're on the other side. You don't need to continue. I mean, I don't know. I, it is an interesting point. I've never really heard in meditative equipoise specifically what draws you out. Because if again, if you can't hear any of these sorts of things, the pistol going off and the atomic bomb going off, well then, what draws you out of it? Yeah, I just I just imagine it not based on any text, but just imagine it just like all being held up in the air. And, and, <laughs> it's done. <laughs> the arc is finished. <laughs> so Stephen was saying, it's like when you throw, imagine, he imagines it when, like when you throw a ball up in the air and it kind of has an arc and then eventually falls to the ground when it's complete. But there is, yeah, I'm sure there's some sense of completion or something that goes on where there's no necessity to remain in that. You know, there are, yeah. I went back and again looked at chapter four of Ornament, the study guide, study manual for that. And again, it talks about three meditative equipoises that when we divide it up, the meditative equipoise that is the uninterrupted path, which as I mentioned is when you go into that and it's acting at that time as an antidote to whatever level of the obscurations that are being removed. The liberated path when that has been, has occurred, the cessation is there now. It will not recur again, those levels of obscurations. The third, is called a meditative equipoise, which is neither of those. And that is when you're actually, you're realizing emptiness, but you're not removing another layer of the obscurations because you can go back into meditative equipoise on emptiness, but you don't have the strength of merit to go along with removing the next layer of obscurations. So, so it does seem like, again, there, you, in those cases, maybe the Bodhisattva is making a more conscious choice about how long to stay in meditative equipoise. I don't know. That is a... There's no such thing as meditative equipoise. Maybe it's <laughs> maybe that the, the, the uh, conventional realities exist. They've always existed side by side, but yeah. you know your 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 awareness of the two of them simultaneously. Really? Yeah. I don't know, Mark. I mean, it's an interesting. Uh, idea. I don't know that, that Mark was saying for those online that um, maybe there is no such thing as meditative equipoise, that it's always existed side by side with conventional awareness, our mundane awareness. But, but I think we are talking about, in this tradition, we tend to talk about things as something we can create the causes and conditions for. And so in that way, it can't be present already because then we would be able to realize it without the causes and conditions, it would seem, in my way of looking at it. But I admit I'm a bit linear. <laughs> I think you, you you think more, I don't know, outside of linear scope sometimes. So that's okay. I mean, I, I, and again, whether these ideas are true or not, it's just the idea, the main idea of all this is we need to strive to do this. Somehow we need to get into that space of this meditative equipoise, which in this tradition is very much strengthened by our familiarity with emptiness. And of course, as Bob pointed out, our depth of meditation, concentration that we can bring to bear on that so we can have that union of calm abiding and special insight and be, make it become non-conceptual with regard to emptiness yeah bob well i mean, I mean the meditative equipoise has to be there yeah. because that's said to be the direct antidote yeah your, your various levels of obscuration yeah. i mean that's yeah um, half the meditation that can um, conceivably go into meditative equipoise to remove deeper and deeper levels of obscuration right, right. So, it's I mean, the it's means by which that's done yeah Right. So it does seem to be you know, established. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. That's, yeah, certainly that's my understanding as well. So Bob was just saying, yeah, I mean, this is the mechanism by which uh, it's been laid out through all the texts that beings attain realizations and progress along the path. <laughs> I mean, even the Buddha himself spoke to this. It's not like, you know, this came up from 
Nagarjuna or Chandrakirti or some later Buddhist. These go back to the Prajnaparamita Sutras and how it's set out. Recall that again, and while the explicit subject of those texts is emptiness, the implicit subject is the realizations of the path, everything that moves you along to get you to the place of Buddhahood eventually. So it is a said to be a progressive thing, but again, I can only speak to yeah, what I've, I've learned and know. I don't know the things that you brought up, like for example, tonight, Mark, with that one, I, I couldn't make a definitive response other than saying that this is how it's taught. Assertion, sort of the assertion that I'm familiar with in mm -hmm. other variety of ways, uh -huh. that, that that there's a, a point where where the past mm -hmm. must be forgotten. Mm -hmm. The past is not forgotten in the past. Mm -hmm. in the past it was a, it was a, a, a dualistic, you know, oh, yeah, right. so the, so the, yeah, that's all. That's okay. All. And again, I'd have to hear more about how to interpret that, the, the path. I mean, I know we have this concept in, in even in this tradition that the Dharma is the boat to get you to the other shore, but you don't need the boat when you get to the other shore. I mean, at some level, we recognize that there is kind of a, um, everything in the end is abandoned that way because it's, it's, but it doesn't mean that we, I don't know, I'm, I'm not speaking exactly to what your point is, but it doesn't mean that again, we, we have to completely discard any things because everything's in a process of transformation. Everything that happens on the path eventually becomes a result. You know, it's not that they're totally separate things. I don't know. It, these get to be debates that I'm not sure are the most productive. So it's eight eight sixteen. So one more comment, Stephen. Did you? Want oh yeah, just yeah, just quickly. I was you know, thinking about what Mark said, and uh -huh. you know, when we talk we talk about removal of the afflictions or the um, uncovering of um, you know, something underneath the knowledge of aspirations. Right. It seems like there's always something there um, mm -hmm. from the beginning, even before the beginning, right. even beginningless time. Right. So, yeah, perhaps it can be kind of glimpsed in our day-to-day -day lives as a sort of a, a flexing self-awareness or something that's going on mm -hmm. that isn't conceptual thought because mm -hmm. we're flitting back and forth all the time there are gaps in our conceptual sure. thought and there's things going on mm -hmm. I don't want to say unconsciously but subliminally mm -hmm. in our cognition that that aren't engaging with an object conceptually mm -hmm. just the simple example is like if you were to think back five minutes right. remember the exact words you were saying five minutes ago I don't know if I could do that Maybe I don't think so. <laughs> but you knew you were conscious of that time. Mm. Right. You were engaged with whatever it was you were saying, and you were engaged with whatever mm. you were trying to understand you were <laughs> But we were all, yeah. there's also, there's some kind of other functionality of right. consciousness that's True. sort of not conventionally related and not objectified. No. Just sort of like subliminally operating behind the scenes, behind the conventional. So, conventional so again, I don't know if people online heard that either, but again, Stephen was just making a comment that there does seem to be, in his experience, some gaps in our minds where we have moments that don't seem where we're holding, like conceiving of an object or even some sort of objective appearance, and those sort of gaps give us some idea. Again, nonetheless, when we studied minds, the, the first part of Lorik, where we talked about different states of mind and what have you, and uh, the sort of Buddhist um, view of epistemology, how the mind knows, we delineated there something, again, that was called a yogic direct perceiver that was this heightened way of understanding some sort of direct perception when we are knowing truths such as impermanence, such as emptiness, and so on. So it does still seem to be, even though we can get some glimpses of that, something quite unique about what we're talking about here, which is a more sustained awareness in that direct cognition, that mode of direct cognition. But I don't know, again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I mean, I, I, when I get questions like this, I'm never trying to like discount what people's experiences are, because I can't speak to your experience. Your experience is your experience. And so I don't want to ever negate that. But at the same time, I do, I am kind of committed to, 
setting forward what is classically taught about in this tradition, which as I say, I admit is very logic bound and analytical bound, linear bound in a very you know <laughs> direct way. And that's okay, but the experience of it is something else. You know, they always say that, you know, the, this is just giving us the idea of emptiness. They say it's like trying to describe the taste of, of uh, sugar cane. Whereas if you actually bite into the sugar cane, you're gonna have a totally different experience, right? So, you know, we'll all get to taste the sugar cane someday, and then we can speak to it perhaps very differently. But so we made it up to verse 10 tonight, which is great. We'll continue next week. Uh, let's go ahead and do a few dedication prayers. Page 235. We'll do the first two prayers on that page. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. And go forward to page 244. Um, and if you are here in the Gompa on page 245 is paper clipped a uh, prayer for his holiness. Uh, we'll do that one first, and then we'll do the prayer for Lama Zopa on page 244. And as we recite this, as usual, think about all of our gurus and all spiritual teachers in this world who are helping sentient beings to practice morality, to um, you know, have more happiness, more freedom from suffering in their lives. May all these guides have good health and long lives. The wish-granting, wish-fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, to the incomparably kind Tenzin Gyatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjuna's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three jewels, Savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. And then lastly, make uh, prayers for those who uh, are in your heart right now, beings who are experiencing obstacles or illness, who have died or who are dying, as well as parts of the world where there's great suffering. We can send this positive energy out so that it becomes the cause, the means by which all these beings are free from their suffering and they find all the causes that lead to perfect happiness. And may all beings be free from suffering and find true happiness through what we've done here today. Okay, thank you all very much. Appreciate everyone's questions. Thank you all online as well. <laughs>